Today, 1st April, before I proceed with a summary of what's been going on in Ukraine and the conflict in Ukraine and um, look back over the events of the last few weeks and last month, March in particular, I think it's important first once again to return to the subject of the Crocus City Hall attack. Now, we have not received further information from the investigation, but we have now seen the Russian Foreign Ministry take what looks to me very much like the first step connected with um, an application, um, an ultimatum, if you prefer, to Ukraine in connection with the events maybe on Crocus City Hall, but other events that have taken place, which the Ukrainians have carried out over the last two years and beyond that in, ag against Russia. And this uh, first step took the form of a statement by the Russian Foreign Ministry, which apparently is in a form of... Pre what we're getting is basically a press release of this statement that has been communicated to the Ukrainian side by the Russian government. Apparently, they used um, the embassy of Belarus. Belarus apparently still has an embassy in Kiev. And they conveyed what looks like not exactly an ultimatum to the Ukrainian government. We're still some distance from that, but a big step <coughs> towards the issuing by the Russian government, the Russian authorities, of an ultimatum to Ukraine connected to terrorist incidents involving Ukraine in Russia, and I suspect leading in time to an ultimatum over the events of Crocus City Hall, if the investigation into that incident continues to take the kind of direction that we have been seeing. Anyway, this is what the Russian Foreign Ministry um, says in its press release, um, and I'm taking this directly from its web website. The brutal terrorist attack committed in Krasnogorsk, Krasnogorsk is the suburb of Moscow, where Crocus City Hall is located, on March 22nd, which shocked the whole world, is far from the first act of terrorism targeting our country in recent time. The investigative actions carried out by the competent authorities in Russia indicate that the trails of all these crimes lead to Ukraine. That's a very careful paragraph. It says that there have been many attacks on Russia, many terrorist incidents uh, in Russia, it mentions Crocus City Hall, the attack on Crocus City Hall, and then it carefully says that investigations carried out in Russia indicate <clears throat> that the trails of all of these crimes lead to Ukraine. It doesn't specifically say that Ukraine was involved or was behind the attack on Crocus City Hall, the wording is slightly ambiguous. It might make you think that Crocus City Hall, the Crocus City Hall attack, was one of those crimes in which where the trails lead to Ukraine. After all, it does talk about all these crimes. But another way of reading this sentence is that it is exclusive of the attack on Crocus City Hall and that the trail of all of the other crimes, the uh, various acts of terrorism committed against Russia, which of which other than Crocus City Hall, that the trail in all of those uh, attacks leads to Ukraine. That's careful language. Perhaps the Russian text is less ambiguous, I'm not sure. But this is the Foreign Ministry's website. It's their translation. And I think that at the moment, 
They're deliberately keeping this ambiguous. Then it goes on to say this. Other barbaric bomb attacks took the lives of journalists Daria Dugina and Maxim Fomin, otherwise known as Vladlen Tatarsky, seriously injured writer Yevgeny Prilepin and killed his driver, Alexander Shubin. Five people were killed by an explosion of the Crimean Bridge and 42 were wounded in an explosion in a cafe in St. Petersburg. The killing and mutilation of citizens, including children, was accompanied by raids by the terrorist organization known as Russia Volunteer Corps. Now, this refers to the attacks on the border villages in Belgorod and Kursk region. And, of course, as far as the Russians are concerned, the Russian Volunteer Corps, the supposed dissident um, unit of uh, Russian dissidents who disapprove of Vladimir Putin's government. Well, as far as the Russians are concerned, that unit, the people who make that up, are terrorists, and it's a terrorist group. So that's what the Russians say. And then the foreign ministry statement goes on to say the following. In this regard, the Russian foreign ministry has put forward a demand for the Russian or Ukrainian authorities under the International Convention for the Suppression of Terrorist Bombings and the International Convention for the Suppression of the Financing of Terrorism <clears throat> to immediately arrest and extradite every person implicated in the above terrorist acts. Now, notice the careful language again there are references to the international convention for the suppression of terrorist bombings and the international convention for the suppression of the financing of terrorism now what is the financing what terrorist acts do the russians might the russians say the ukrainians have some people in ukraine have financed um, well, there are rumours, there are reports, rather not rumours, there are reports that the Russian investigative agencies are now saying that the financing for the Kroka City Hall attack came from Ukraine and there's been reports and claims that cryptocurrencies were used to finance that attack. Now, I don't know whether this is one of those incidents that are mentioned, that are included in this uh, demand that has been made to the Russian, to the Ukrainian authorities, by the Russian authorities, and whether this invocation of the convention, uh, 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 of the Con International Convention for the Suppression of Financing of Terrorism, therefore refers specifically to Crocus City Hall, or whether perhaps it refers to the funding of the other incidents, perhaps specifically to the funding of the Russian Volunteer Corps. Unless and until we are provided with the actual note given by the Russian authorities to Ukraine, we can't say that. The press statement, as I have said, is very ambiguous. And the press statement then goes on to say that Ukraine is told that it must immediately arrest and extradite every person implicated in the above terrorist acts. So clearly, the murder of Daria Dugina the murder of Maxim Formin, otherwise known as Vladlen Tatarsky, the attack on Yevgeny Prilepin, which killed his driver, Alexander Shubin, the Crimean Bridge attack of October 2022, and the attack on the people in St. Petersburg. In those cases, we can be sure that the Russians I say that everybody who was involved in those attacks um, should be arrested 
and hand it over to the Russians. But again, the language of this press statement leaves it open whether the Russians are also asking for the handover of people who were involved in the Proker City Hall attack on 22nd March. The other thing, of course, we don't know from this statement is whether the Russians have actually provided the Ukrainians with a list of persons. But the next paragraph suggests that they have in fact done so. And the paragraph reads, one of the demands is to arrest head of the security service of Ukraine, Vasily Malyuk, who cynically admitted on March 25th that Ukraine was behind the bombing of the Crimean Bridge in October 2022 and revealed details of the organization of other attacks in the Russian Federation. Now, that, of course, tells us that um, that does suggest that there is a list because we're told that is one of the demands is to arrest the head of the security service, the SBU, Vasily Malyuk. And the fact that it's only one of the demands suggests that the Russians, strongly suggests that the Russians have supplied a list. And here, by the way, the reference to Vasily Malyuk and what he said in that disastrous interview he gave on the 25th of March, which, by the way, has been completely ignored, certainly in the British media, but as far as I'm aware, in the American and European media also. That disastrous interview is now playing directly into the hands of the Russians because the Ukrainians, until very recently, were playing a game of pretense, pretended denial, that they were directly implicated or in, implicated in any way in any one of these attacks. They dropped heavy hints that they were involved soon after the Crimean Bridge attack, for example. But they were very careful never to come out with out, outright admissions that they had done so. Now, Maliuk has effectively done that, and of course the Russians are seizing on it. And they're able to say to an international audience, and we'll come to which audience they have in mind in a moment, they'll be able to say it to an international audience that there is really absolutely no doubt whatsoever that Ukraine is indeed guilty of these terrorist attacks because the head of their own security service, Vasily Malyuk, has admitted as much. And then the statement concludes, the press statement con concludes, the fight against international terrorism is the responsibility of every state. Now that, again, is a double-edged sentence. Every state includes Ukraine, of course, but includes every other state as well. So it could be used to put pressure, or at least to embarrass, Ukraine's sponsors, primarily Britain, France, Germany, and the United States, the countries that have been providing the funding to Ukraine, the countries that have been providing weapons to Ukraine. They have an international responsibility. This is widely accepted. It is part of international law to fight terrorism, to assist in the fight against terrorism. And yet they have been providing assistance, very substantial material assistance, to a state which by the admission of its own head, of the head of its own security service, Vasily Malyuk has, as the Russians say, cynically admitted Ukraine's involvement in terrorist acts. And then the press statement goes on to say, the Russian side demands that the Kiev regime immediately cease any support for terrorist activities extradite the perpetrators and compensate for the damage caused to the victims. Ukraine's violation of its obligations under the anti-terrorist conventions 
will entail international legal liability. Now, this is a most fascinating statement altogether. And, of course, the clue as to the audience that is being ultimately addressed by statements of this kind is provided by that last sentence of all, that um, the, um, the Ukraine's violation of its obligations under the anti-terrorist conventions will entail international legal liability. Now, it's often struck me that the Russian government, the Russian foreign ministry, the Russians in their entirety, and the way in which they conduct international relations, tend to take an extremely legalistic approach. They're very, very careful to prepare the ground legally before they take any actual step. By the way, I know many people uh, um, are very interested in um, comparing today's statesmen with the statesmen of the past, and the name of Bismarck often comes up. Bismarck, for the record, was also someone who was extremely careful to prepare his um, the, prepare his the legal case for whatever he wanted to do very carefully before he acted, and the Russians are the same. In fact, on so many occasions, the Russian foreign ministry behaves rather like a big international law firm of the kind you find in New York and London and in other places. They, they prepare the legal grounds for their case, they assemble the facts, and then the first step they take is they publish what Americans call a cease and desist letter. The British more often simply refer to it as a letter before action. In other words, a written statement to the other side stating in general terms what the case is and threatening legal action unless the other side stops doing the wrong things that it is doing, admits liability and agrees to pay compensation. And of course, if you go back to the um, press release, we see that that's exactly what the Russians are doing with this statement. The Russian side demands that the Kiev regime immediately cease any support for terrorist activities, extradite the perpetrators, and compensate for the damage caused to the victims. Cease, hand over, and pay. Exactly what, as I said, big international law firms do. So, what then is the audience that the Russians are addressing? Well, we see that, that they intend to pursue remedies under the anti-terrorist conventions seeking to enforce Ukraine's international legal liability. And I suspect what this means is that there is going to be an application made fairly soon to the International Court of Justice in The Hague. So that's the first step that the Russians are taking. Now, that can take a very long time. We can have a decade of legal proceedings. But of course, taking that first step puts Ukraine on the back foot. Eventually, more may come. It would be, by the way, already very embarrassing to the United States and to Ukraine's uh, Western backers if uh, the Russians are able to put together a strong case against under the anti-terrorism conventions to the International Court of Justice against Ukraine, especially if the International Court of Justice were to agree to make interim orders against Ukraine. Just saying. But beyond that, of course, an, an action brought by the Russians to the International Court of Justice 
does not exhaust the options that the Russians might have. They could go a whole step further than that. They could argue that the existence of terrorists in Ukraine and the fact that Ukraine is protecting these terrorists and the fact that these terrorists are conducting terrorist acts against the Russian Federation means that the Russian Federation faces a um, real and present danger from Ukraine, that Ukraine is not fulfilling its international obligations to fight terrorism, but is on the contrary sponsoring it, and that might then enable the Russians to present a much stronger ultimatum to Ukraine, demanding action and threatening rather more direct consequences than the kind of claim to the International Court of Justice, which we see being referenced in this press statement. And to reiterate again, this is not this would not be the first time something like that had happened. Um, the United States made exactly that took exactly that kind of approach towards the Taliban government in Afghanistan in the autumn of 20, 2001. It demanded that the Taliban government hand over Osama bin Laden. And when the um, Taliban delayed a reply, they didn't, by the way, refuse outright to do it. There were attempts, apparently, to negotiate some kind of face-saving way to hand over Osama bin Laden, but I'm not going to go into the details of all of that in this program. But anyway, when the Taliban refused to comply according to the stringent terms that the United States insisted upon, well, the way was open, or at least the United States considered that the way was open for it to take military action against Afghanistan together with its allies. So precedent for this actually exists. Now, I know there will be many objections to this course that the Russians are taking in the West. Many will say, for example, that even as of the time, that certainly as of the time of making this press statement, the case against Ukraine in relation to Crocus City Hall is, to put it generously, incomplete. Others would use much stronger words. But the Russians have been handed a loaded gun, legally speaking, by this crass interview that Vasily Malyu gave on the 25th of March. Now, I, I have to say that I, am, I was puzzled by this interview when it was given. I think the United States must be absolutely furious that Vasily Malyuk gave the interview that he did. As I said, there's radio silence about it right across the um, Western media that I'm aware of. Um, I suspect that behind the scenes, there is a fierce argument going on between the United States and Ukraine of which this interview is a public expression. I wonder whether Maliuk didn't make this interview in effect as a way of threatening the United States, saying to the United States, look, yes, it's true, we've done all these terrible things that you're talking about. We have no, uh, we're making no apology for the fact that we did them. And if you press us, to stop doing what we have been doing, well, we have a whole load of information about you, which we can make publish public, which you are going to find extremely embarrassing. I wonder whether this is part, maybe, part of what is going on here. Um, it's all very strange. 
that interview really has no fully satisfactory explanation. But whatever the explanation for the interview is, we see how the Russians are taking advantage of it and how they're now methodically building up a case, exactly as I said, as an inter international law firm, law firm does, connected to what might be the evidence that comes out of the investigation into the attack on Crocus City Hall. Anyway, I spent some time on this. I'm now going to turn to the situation in Ukraine on the battlefronts. And can I say straight away that um, Dima at the Military Summary Channel in um, his last but one video did a, I thought, masterly summary of what has been happening in on the front lines in March of this year, the last month. Um, he said that this had been a, an extremely consequential month. And about that, I completely agree. There are some points of detail where perhaps I might take issue with some of the things that he said. Not all we will have a right to disagree with each other. But I too believe that M March has been a particularly important month in this war. Firstly, as Dima correctly said, there has been a steady rising trend in Ukraine's casualty rates over the course uh, since the start of this year. We were already told at the beginning of the, um, in the first few weeks of this year that Ukraine's casualties are running at some time, something like three times the level that they were this time last year. And it's important to remember that this, this time last year, the particularly terrible battle of Bakhmut was underway. Well, this year, it's three times worse than that. And in March, it appears to have got even worse. So in February, Ukraine lost 27,000 men dead and wounded, according to the U Russian Defense Ministry. In March, it was around 30,000. It's been a steadily rising trend. I seem to recall it was 23,000 in January. So it's going, it's steadily going up. Um, this is a rate of loss that Ukraine cannot replace. General Sirsky, that astonishing interview which he gave, which I recently discussed, he accepted that the mobilization law when and if it is eventually passed, is not going to produce the half million men that Ukraine would need to replace all of its losses. Now, of course, again, the objection always comes that these are Russian figures. The Ukrainians have produced figures. I don't think anybody accepts that these figures are credible. Uh, the figure that Zelensky produced a few weeks ago that, it was 30, that Ukraine has suffered 31,000 dead since the start of the special military operation, I think most people would agree, is incredible. Um, I have gradually come round to the view that these Russian numbers are approximately correct, and Ukrainian sources have also been saying that there has been a very significant uptick in Ukrainian losses this year, as compared with the same period last year. And they too admit that losses are running at multiples greater levels than was the case last year. So that is one. The second is that despite this being the time of the Rasputitsa, the Russians are continuing to advance. And um, we're going to come to that in a moment, but there's been Russian advances in places like Novomikhailovka, and Pervomaisky, and we got more news this morning about more Russian advances towards Chasov Yar and also to uh, also in Siversk. So things are happening. The Russians seem to be able to keep pushing forward despite the um, soft ground conditions that prevail in this landscape during this period. 
But thirdly, and most importantly, is that we are now seeing this dramatic escalation in the missile war. And we've had night after night now on a scale that we have never seen at any point in the conflict before. These huge Russian missile and bomb attacks um, and drone attacks right across Ukraine. And we had another big one last night. And the Russian Defense Ministry, again, has provided us with its own very um, brief account of it. It says that the aerospace forces of the Russian Federation delivered one mass strike. Mass strike means that it's right across Ukraine, by air-based, high-precision, long-range weaponry and unmanned aerial vehicles at Ukrainian energy infrastructure and gas production facilities. As a result of the strike, the work of defense industry enterprises for the manufacture and repair of weapons, military equipment and ammunition was disrupted. All goals of the strike were achieved all the assigned targets were engaged. Now, this tells us that last night's strike was carried out exclusively using KH-101 subsonic cruise missiles launched from aircraft. No shipborne uh, weapons were used. Um, and it focused on the Ukrainian energy infrastructure and gas production facilities. So the Russians are now systematically attacking the energy system, Ukraine's energy system. And by the way, John Helmer, who I discussed, um, I think it was two days ago, and who predicted back in 2022 how this war, he calls it the electricity war, would um, play out. Anyway, he's got another very interesting piece on precisely this topic about the latest strikes on his website, Dances with Bears. So we see yet another strike against the, entire, the energy infrastructure of Ukraine. And um, strikes also, it must be said, on the air defense system. Um, yesterday, um, a um, S-300 SAM system was destroyed near Kharkiv. A film of this attack has in emerged. The Russian Defense Ministry describes the attack in this way. One engagement radar, one battlefield command vehicle, one low-altitude surveillance radar, three launches of the S-300 system uh, had been engaged during the, over the course of the day. So an entire S-300 air defense system in Kharkiv was completely destroyed. Um, three launches, all the associated radars, all the associated uh, command vehicles, were destroyed and in fact as I said we have pictures of it and uh, Dima says this was looks like it was done either with an Iskander missile a ballistic missile or um, perhaps a Tornado S uh, rocket the Tornado S is Russia's equivalent of the HIMARS they are by the way now very regularly used on the battlefronts we see them being used every single day um, there are many more um, instances now, nowadays, of tornado airstrikes on Ukrainian positions across the combat lines in Ukraine than we hear of HIMARS strikes. Just, just saying. Anyway, one way or the other, another expensive, irreplaceable S-300 system has just been destroyed near Kharkiv. And um, as it's uh, Dima at the Military Summary Channel has also pointed out when the strike took place, there was no sign of any air defence 
any resistance being provided to whatever missile or rockets were used in this strike. Um, and it looks as if, to all intents and purposes, Kharkiv no longer has a functioning air defence system. And I get the impression that this is increasingly the case right across Ukraine. Um, Kiev still has some functioning air defence assets, but most Ukrainian towns no longer do. Ukraine is no longer able to defend much of its energy infrastructure, and the destruction continues. As to replacing these lost systems, air defense systems, well, there's been news from Germany, which again highlights the problem, because Germany has decided that it is going to increase production, or it's going to start production of Patriot anti-aircraft missiles. By the way, one does wonder why, actually, given that the Russians are now fielding hypersonic missiles like the Zircon, which are no doubt going to appear in ever-increasing numbers, and given that the Patriot missile system, by universal acknowledgement, is incapable of shooting down Zircon hypersonic missiles, why are the Germans investing in producing an air defense missile system which recent developments in um, ground and air launched cruise missiles has rendered obsolete. Maybe that's a question that should be addressed to Chancellor Scholz and to his defense minister Boris Pistorius because it makes no sense to me at all. But then perhaps one shouldn't see any, one shouldn't look for sense in these kind of decisions. But anyway, Germany is apparently planning to start production, its own production, of Patriot, obsolete Patriot uh, air defense uh, mi missiles. But the first one is likely to roll off the production lines if all goes well in three years' time. And apparently there's a contract to produce around a thousand of these air defense interceptors, Patriot interceptors in Germany. But as we can see, it's years down the road. And if we know anything at all about Western military procurement processes, what is going to take, what is said, estimated to take three years is more likely to take at least five. Just saying. So anyway, there we go. No real prospect of replacing the Patriot air defense missile systems that Ukraine has already lost. No ability to replace the S-300s. The country that manufactured the S-300 system was, of course, the Soviet Union and then Russia. The Russians have now moved forward with more advanced systems, the S-400 and the S-500 and the S-550 and the S-350, about which I'm not going to spend any time talking about here. But suffice to say that Ukraine is not able to buy any of those, and of course it cannot remotely find other S-300 systems in anything like the numbers needed to replace those it is lost. So, one more of these valuable missile systems lost, irreplaceable systems lost, and there is really nothing, nothing at all that the West can do to replace them. So, a disastrous month, March, a disastrous month in terms of Ukrainian air defences, a disastrous month in terms of the blows on its energy system. And in his article, Helmer, make, his latest article on Dances with Bears, Helmer makes the point that Ukraine can, of course, use various um, engineering solutions to try to transfer electricity from one part of its electric grid to another, um, trying to substitute for 
knocked out power stations. But over time, that will overload the system, what's left of it. And as breakdowns start to arise, the process will exacerbate and get worse. And of course, about that, he's right. And that doesn't even take into account what the Russians themselves might also choose to do. So a disastrous situation in terms of the missile and air war, a disastrous situation in terms of the energy and electricity war, a disastrous situation in terms of the air defense situ air defense system. And we've had that news from Russia that the Russians are now rolling out whole new types of bombs. The new FAB 3000 bomb that is shortly will shortly be entering service. It's now in serial production. Um, the Russians usually manage to, when something, when a piece of equipment like this is in serial production, we start to see them being used actively on the front lines several weeks after that information comes through. So we're probably going to start seeing FAB 3000s being used, say, around late April, May, perhaps. It would be interesting to see what the Russians use them for. It's been suggested, by the way, that there is little point for the Russians to make precision-guided glide bomb versions of the even bigger FAB 5000 and FAB 9000 bombs because of the shortage of carriers, and that's probably correct. Anyway, let's move on. So a very, very bad situation in terms of the energy system, the air defense system, and in the air generally, but also a steadily deteriorating situation throughout March in the ground war. I've already spoken about the very high casualties, but also the very the fact that the Russians, despite all that the Ukrainians have been trying to do, just trying to stem the advance, the fact is that the Russians have continued to advance. This is despite the mud and despite Ukraine stretching its reserves as far as it can to hold back the accumulating pressure. And here we've had significant further news over the last 24 hours. Now, some of this news is now being confirmed by video footage. Um, the Russians are now confirmed to have taken significant further positions to the north and south of that area of Novomikhailovka, this big village south of Marinka, um, which the Russians have been conducting an offensive against basically since Marinka itself fell in December. And there were some reports yesterday that Marinka, that uh, Novomikhailovka was within hours of falling completely under Russian control, by which I mean that the Russian, the Ukrainians would pull out, that the Russians would occupy the territory of the village. Um, there is then always a period of several days when a major clear-out operation takes place, checking to see whether there are any Ukrainian soldiers still hiding in ba basements, um, um, dismantling booby traps and mines and that kind of thing and then it was and then it's assumed and expected that at some point within the next couple of days a formal announcement will be made by the Russian defense ministry that Novomikhailovka is indeed under full Russian control well I have to say this morning um, we didn't get more news from Novomikhailovka confirming that the Ukrainians have indeed fully pulled out of that village. But 
a, a glance at a map at the various positions. And as I said, these are positions that the Russians have captured, which is confirmed by actual video footage. Anyway, um, that shows that this can't be delayed much longer now. Novo Mikhailovka, the battle for Novo Mikhailovka, has, to all intents and purposes, ended. And, again, I think it was about two days ago, we got reports that the Ukrainians had fully pulled out of Pervomaisky. Again, we've not really heard or seen confirmation of that, but video footage has now appeared, which confirms that the Russians have indeed occupied all the territory to the north of um, Pervomaisky, including various built-up areas. There's a small village there, there's actually pictures of this village, a uh, film of this village with a Russian flag flying over one of the buildings. It is, it appears to be um, north of a um, water, um, a, a body of water of some kind. Um, like all of these villages, it looks like an absolutely blasted place. It, the more relics of buildings than um, a functioning village anymore. Perhaps not even really a village. It looks, in fact, like more like the out, an outskirts area of Pervomaisky itself. But anyway, there's a Russian flag there, and it the, its presence confirms that Pervomaisky, the remaining part of Pervomaisky in the West, has indeed been taken into a semicircle. And again, if the Ukrainians haven't yet pulled out, which some reports suggest they might have done, even if they haven't done that, it's difficult to see how absence, absence some successful counterattack, which, to be frank, looks extremely unlikely now. Well, they will have to withdraw from the remaining part of Perbomaisky at some point within the next few hours or days at most, or risk becoming completely surrounded and taken into a cauldron, which I presume even people like Zelensky and Sirsky won't want to see. So it does look as if, just as the battle for Novo Mikhailovka is to all intents and purposes over, so the battle for Pervomaisky is to all intents and purposes also over. Now, um, we've heard a lot more about the events that have led up to this, to this um, situation with Pervomaisky, this, this big Russian advance taking all the territory to the north of this town. And it's, it's again, pretty dramatic in the sense that it seems that after the fall of Tonenka, this village to the west of Bakhmut, which is one of the villages in the defense line that Sirsky tried to create along with Orlovka, Semyonka, and um, Berdichi, once Tonenka fell, the Russians drove west, and they did so in an armored wave. 36 tanks, according to the Ukrainians, 12 armored personnel carriers. This is an immensely strong armored fist. And notice that these tanks and armored vehicles drove across these open fields, um, despite the fact that it's the Rasputin superior, the month season, which again confirms that Russian tanks and armored vehicles are able to operate in these kind of conditions in a way that Western tanks 
struggle to do. On that topic, by the way, Forbes now has an argument, an article about Challenger 2, saying that this was not really the an appropriate tank for Ukrainian conditions. Um, it's too heavy, not really good for operating on soft ground. There's been all kinds of problems hauling them out of mud and things of this kind. They tend to get stuck in the mud. And um, there was a mistake in effect to supply them in the first place. I find that, by the way, most extraordinary because, of course, that is, as I remember, exactly what I said. And I'm not an expert on tanks at all, but it's exactly what I said right at the outset. I wondered why tanks of that nature, of that size and weight, were being supplied to Ukraine, given the um, climate and the conditions. I remember the British um, tank officer, um, Hamish de Breton Gordon, assuring us that Challenger 2s had better ability to operate in muddy conditions than Russian tanks, because, you know, they were somewhat higher on their tracks than the Russian tanks were. I was skeptical about it. I remember watching a program in which a British NCO, whose job it was to maintain the Challenger 2s, begged to disagree with Hamish de Breton Gordon. We've had pictures of these tanks. Uh, uh, the the, the uh, Sun sent a team to see these Challenger 2 tanks operating, saw one of these tanks vanish into a swampy hull. Basically, the Challenger 2s have failed. And I think this is the, the sooner this is acknowledged, the better. But no Western tank has really succeeded in Ukraine. None of them have managed to um, operate effectively in these difficult conditions. Um, whereas the Russian tanks are perfectly adapted to them. And we see that the Russians have been able to launch an armoured fist from Toninka with 36 tanks and 12 infantry fighting vehicles. And they've been able to operate successfully despite the mud. Now, the Ukrainians claim that 12 of these tanks were knocked out, which is probably true, quite possibly true. There's no confirmation of this. I've not seen any film of this. I would have expected, by the way, that had the been this success in knocking out Russian tanks in this attack. We would have seen some pictures of it, but, you know, the Ukrainians haven't provided it. Maybe there are reasons for that. But one way or the other, the likelihood is that these 12 tanks have been retrieved by the Russians, that they can repair them. So it's probably not that these tanks have been totally destroyed and anyway, the Russians have achieved their objective. They have, in effect, encircled the Ukrainians in Pervomaisky, forcing the Ukrainians to withdraw, to, to decide whether they should withdraw, or in the alternative, to allow themselves to be trapped. So, a disastrous picture in Pervomaisky, and as I said, the battles for Pervomaisky the Battle for Perovomaisky and the Battle for Novomikhailovka both look like they're over. This morning, we have also had further news in the Bakhmut direction. And this is a good example, by the way, of how sometimes events happen on the ground that we are not kept aware of, even as they are happening. Because it's now clear that the Russians have conducted a significant advance in the territory immediately to the east of Chasov Yar. And there's actually been a report about this in the Russian TASS news agency. And it reads as follows. Russian troops have taken control of several str strategic Ukrainian strongholds near Chasov Yar in the Donetsk People's Republic advisor to DPR 
to the DPR head, um, Igor Kimakovsky told TASS on Monday. Our assault groups, supported by artillery, the aerospace forces and FPV drone teams, have taken control of several strongholds of Ukrainian armed formations near Chasov Yar. The strongholds seized by our troops of strategic significance and correspondingly prospects. Therefore, Russian teams, assault teams have advanced considerably towards Chasov Yar, placing a larger part of the Ukrainian combat group supply routes in that area under their gunfire control. So we've now had other reports from Telegram channels which place the Russians 650 meters east of the outskirts of Chasov Yar. And apparently all the major fortified lines that the Ukrainians had all the trench lines and other positions that the Ukrainians had created um, east of Chasov Yar have now fallen to the Russians. So as soon as the Russians consolidate control in this area, they will be able to launch an attack on Chasov Yar, if that is, of course, what they choose to do, which, by the way, for various th reasons, I think it is. Now... Um, here, a number of things need to be said. We're talking not about the entirety of Chasov Yar. We're talking about a district of Chasov Yar east of the Chasov Yar Canal. Um, some commentators, some reporters, Russian reporters, refer to this district as Canal, and that can be a bit confusing. It doesn't reference the canal itself. It refers to this eastern district. Um, it seems to me that it will be the priority of the Russians to capture this position, whether they decide to cross the canal itself and to take Chasov Yar in this spring period. I'm not able to say. And lastly, we've had a lot of more reports coming in of a big Russian advance towards Siversk, and it comes in a completely unexpected direction. It seems that the Russian forces have advanced deep into Ukrainian, formerly Ukrainian-controlled territory from the south, pushing, no pushing northwards from basically the area of Solidar and these villages that were captured initially by the Wagner organization this time last year, villages like Sako and Vanzetti and all of those places. And it seems that the Russians are now um, occupying or at least trying to capture a railway station, um, which, if they are able to capture it to cut various roads, will lead to the collapse of Ukrainian positions to the southwest, and which would then open the way for an attack on Chasov Yar from the southwest. Oh, sorry, sorry on oh, sorry, on Siversk, an attack on Siversk from the southwest. So we see lots of things going on on the battlefields, and. As we have already discussed in many, many programs, Ukraine, desperately short of manpower, equipment, machines, struggling to hold back the Russians, still able to keep fighting. There are still Ukrainian troops with fight in them. but They're becoming increasingly tired, increasingly worn out, they're short of ammunition and supplies. And they're, and they're not really able to maintain their um, combat capability for very much longer. And going back to yesterday's program, I discussed a long discussion by uh, the Russian journalist, war reporter Marat Khairulin. He said that the Russians have no need at the moment to consider 
launching some big arrow offensive because their constriction strategy is already working. And we could see how this is playing out on the ground. To reiterate again, Perwomyski falls. That opens the way for the capture of Krasnogorovka to the south. It's now apparently been widely acknowledged that that is, in fact, the next Russian objective. After Avdevka, the priority was Pervomaisky. Pervomaisky captured. The next objective is Krasnogorovka. The Russians have been attacking Krasnogorovka from the south, from Marinka. Um, now, with Pervomaisky and Nevolska under Russian control, they can launch an attack on Krasnogorovka from the north and from the east, as well as from the south, with Krasnogorovka repeatedly bombed, it's impossible to see how the Ukrainians could resist there for very long. Krasnogorovka falls, Pervomaisky is already captured, Novomikhailovka, either already captured or very soon captured reports that the Russians now control most of Georgievka, west of Marinka. There, is a, there are opportunities now open up for Russian advances on Kurakovo from multiple directions. Kurakovo falls, the supply lines to Vugladar in the south become, start to be cut off. Vugladar falls, and the Ukrainian positions in the rest of Zaporozhye region, the parts of Zaporozhye region, start to look increasingly fragile. And we see how the Russians are already making the first probing moves. They've um, made moves towards, moves seeking to push towards, to improve their positions south of the important town of Guiliapolie. Today we got reports that a bridge across a river which bisects Guiliapolie has been destroyed by a Russian missile strike. There's actually rather dramatic footage of this missile strike, by the way. And all of this leading to a potential advance towards Orechov to the north, from the Rabotino area, from Guiliapolie, bringing the Russians to the Dnieper in this area too, and perhaps isolating the city of Zaporozhye, which is on the east bank of the Dnieper, whose defences then will become very fragile. And... If all of this happens, then at the same time the Russians have freer hands to advance towards the Dnieper in other directions, from Chasov Yar, through Konstantinovka, and perhaps Kramatorsk, if they decide to attack Kramatorsk first. And of course, if Siversk falls, the Russians can then focus on retaking Liman, perhaps Kupiansk, and that opens the way for an attack on um, Slavyan Slavyansk and conceivably an advance towards the Dnieper from that direction as well. The point is that, as I've said many times, this is a complex game of checkers, but the hardest part has already been done with the capture of Bakhmut and Avdevka, the two lynch positions within the whole system. And from this point on, with the Russians anyway getting stronger, and with their resources becoming greater, and with Ukrainian resources becoming weaker, the Russians are in a position to accelerate the tempo. They can start taking these places faster and faster 
as the remaining 45 positions become fewer in number and as the road and railway system, which has up to now worked for the Ukrainians, starts to pass increasingly under Russian control and starts to work more towards more for the Russians. So to give examples, there is an important railway line through Bakhmut. Siversk itself is a railway hub. We've seen how railway line is uh, leading towards Siversk is now also already being is again being fought over with the Russians attacking a railway station. There's an important railway junction near Avdevka, which the Russians have already captured. And there's an important railway line near Vugladar, which the Russians have controlled for some time, but which they have been unwilling to use because it is vulnerable to um, attack artillery strikes from v Vugladar, and that has complicated Russian supplies in southern Donbass and Zaporozhye. If Vugladar falls, that railway line can also be act activated. Now, the key thing to understand is that the Russian military, like the Ukrainian military, uses, depends on its railway system in order to keep its troops supplied with um, ammunition, um, reinforcements, other war material, and things like food and water and medical supplies. Russia operates its logistic effort through its railways. And if all of the railways in Donbass start to function and function for the Russians, which has not been the case up to now, it becomes possible for the Russians to build up forces in Donbass to a degree that has not been true up to this point in the war. And at that point, the forces become overwhelming with the Ukrainians lacking strategic depth in the area between Donbass and the Dnieper, and the Russians therefore being able to advance towards the Dnieper, towards and to the two cities of Dnieper and Zaporozhye. So understanding all of this, understanding the topography, understanding the importance of the railway lines, understanding the density, the population, the, the urban densities, has explained it to my mind an awful lot about the war. Whilst it is true, or it seems to me to be true, that the Russians, at least from the autumn of 2022, settled on a strategy of attrition to grind the Ukrainians down. To a great extent, the landscape, the geography of Donbass also dictated that strategy. It, it has required the Russians to gradually dismantle this very elaborate defense system that the Ukrainians created since the 2014 crisis in this area before they can even start to think of the kind of big arrow offensives that some people have been talking about, that whether they decide to execute offensives like that, none of us knows. Now, the key thing to say is that there is nothing that can happen now that I can see which can change the trajectory. Um, the British are out of equipment. The French are talking about sending more wheeled, well, they call them infantry fighting vehicles, light, ve light armoured vehicles to the Ukrainian military. These are old, old armoured vehicles that the French army has stopped using. They're hardly suited. They're no more suited to Ukrainian conditions than they 
AMX 10RC so called wheeled tanks were. Indeed, I believe that these wheeled vehicles that the French are now proposing sending to Ukraine are related in some way. They're part of the same family of vehicles as the AMX 10RCs. So this is a poisoned gift. Um, the West, not really in a position to supply armoured vehicles. The F-16 affair turning into a debacle. There is some talk now in the United States that sometime in April, some kind of vote will finally be made in the House of Representatives apportioning funding for supporting Ukraine. But whatever it will be, even if it's the full $61 billion, it is still less, significantly less, than what Ukraine received in 2023 and what Ukraine received in 2022. And we see that in both cases, that was not enough to enable Ukraine to achieve victory. With the Russians so much stronger and better organised this year than they were in 2022, 2023, again, it's impossible to see what this extra funding would achieve, most of which, anyway, it seems, is going to remain in the United States doing whatever one expects it to do there. So, the whole trajectory of this war is now set. My own feeling is that whilst it is likely that we will start to see further signs of breakdown in the Ukrainian defence system in the summer, Probably by that point, the strain will begin to become visibly unbearable. The big blow will probably come in the second half of this year. The Russians are now unveiling, or are now busy working on producing a whole series of new weapon systems. Apparently, they're preparing to mass produce uh, um, AI. A, uh, drones with AI um, capabilities, which will be mass produced and which will be able to operate in swarms on the battlefields and will be able to attack and ad identify and attack targets without guidance systems from human operators. We see the robots operating in Verdici, and it's likely that we're going to see an awful lot more robots appearing from the Russians before very soon. I discussed a rather mysterious visit that Shoigu recently made to a um, unidentified series of factories in the Altai region. I wonder whether that might be one of the places where these drones, these robots, these ground drones, these robots, are being manufactured. Anyway, it's scary stuff, but anyway, we're going to see AI robots and AI drones operating on the battlefronts. The Russians are talking about deploying heavy drones as well. The S-70 Ochotnik will apparently be entering service. We're going to see the Fab 30 um, the Fab 3000 bomb, precision guided bomb, increasingly used. All kinds of new weapon systems are apparently likely to come online in Russia this year. And as I said, President Putin says that um, the military spend as a proportion of Russian GDP has jumped this year from 4% of GDP in 2023 to 6.8% of GDP this year, which suggests that we're going to see a big, that this is going to be the year of the biggest equipment surge that the Russian army has experienced.
today. So it's likely that all of this will come to fruition around the summer. We can start to see the weight of pressure become intolerable on Ukraine from about then and cascading breakdowns and perhaps Russian deeper Russian advances starting to happen from about then. Well, we'll just have to wait and see. Now, to those who still hope, hope, as they say, springs eternal, that there's going to be some kind of major economic collapse in Russia um, over the next um, few months, or in this year, um, Russia has now um, published its PMI index, or rather not Russia, S&P Global has published its PMI index, um, Russian Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index, um, for March 2024. It was up to 55.7 from 54.7, in February, um, just to say that any reading above 50 speaks of expansion. We now see that things are very well set for expansion, which confirms what uh, Russia's central bank chair El Elvira Nabulina said to us a short time ago. And um, this is what... Um, S&P Global said it's at the supporting overall growth with steeper expansions in output and new orders, with the latter rising at the fastest rate in over 16 years. Contributing to the increase in total new sales was a new up, renewed uptick in new export orders at Russian goods producers. Firms also raised their production levels in March, output grew at the sharpest pace since January 2017, with companies commonly attributing the upturn to more robust demand conditions. <laughs> and um, according to, as uh, manufacturers secured more full-time staff to build capacity with the rate of job creation accelerating to the steepest since November 2000, according to the report. That was November 2000, was right at the start of the pre-2008 Russian economic boom. We were looking at growth rates at that time of around 7%. This was a recovery boom. The period between 1998 and 2008 was a recovery boom after the crisis of the 1990s. I'm just saying. Um, so growth rates during that period were very high, 7% of GDP year on year. Um, unlikely we'll achieve anything like that this time. We are not coming out of a recession crisis this time. Certainly nothing like what we saw in the 1990s. But one way or the other, we can see boom conditions. And it says that manufacturers have secured more full-time staff to build capacity. That begs many, many questions. I would not be surprised if what we're actually seeing is exactly what I have anticipated would happen, which is that Russian factories are taking on more guest workers. Guest workers from Central Asia, and all sorts of other places. So anyway, there is not going to be an economic collapse within the next few months. I don't think there's going to be any kind of economic collapse at all. Export revenues are rising. The price of oil has been rising. Um, the Russians have the resources to continue the war. In fact, they've probably got more resources than they bargained for. And all of this as Ukraine gets weaker and weaker. Now, I've been making these points in program after program after program. The analysis speaks for itself. The facts speak for themselves. 
There is no takeaway from this. No one in the West says this can't work, can't go on. We've got to find a way out. Um, still, the hope is send more money to Ukraine. A few billion here, a few more billion there. Send real armoured carriers from France. Build obsolete Patriot missiles in Germany. doesn't matter if it takes you three years before you get any of them. And the technology has already been rendered out of date. Just go on doing what you're doing. Crank out endless complaints about uh, Russian misinformation. There's a bizarre article about this in the Financial Times today. It says that the German government is becoming really concerned about the sophistication and skill of Russian propaganda efforts. And it says that one of the problems in refuting much of this propaganda is that it is unfalsifiable, which is an elaborate way of saying it, that much of it is true, that Germany is indeed in recession and things are getting worse there. So um, just go on, however, doing all of that. Be as belligerent in your language as you can possibly get. And just... Continue as you have before, even as this locomotive, which has been put on its tracks, hurtles with gathering speed and momentum towards you. I simply don't understand it. I never will. I know all the arguments, all the rationalizations. The people come up with, I don't understand them. It is a tragedy for me, but there it is. Anyway, this is where I end my program today. More from me soon. Let me remind you again that you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Don't forget to check out our shop where we have all our amazing things, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoods, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, all those great things. And last but not least, if you like this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.